Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this this uh, Elixir Conf 2020 talk. Uh, this is the contributing to Elixir and the ecosystem: how to be in the loop talk, and it is brought to you by Leandro Hello, Pereira. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this. Welcome. This. Uh... Thanks, Andre. Hey everyone. Uh, my name is Leandro. And those are my handles to find me on Twitter and GitHub, and also my blog where I post articles once a year or so. <laughs> I'm super excited to be part of a conference and that that was my that has been my source of learning and fun for the last few years. And I would start this presentation by asking people to raise their hands if they never contributed to open source before. So I would get to know my audience, but I guess that's not gonna happen today. At the same time, I must confess that I always had this fear of public speaking with people staring at me, but I kind of miss seeing some faces. So I hope it don't sound too awkward. So why this talk? I have been working with Leaksir full time for the past four years or so, and I made a few contributions with code, podcasts, meetups, articles, and some other stuff. And I have learned a thing or two in this process that I would like to share. And besides that, some friends ask me, hey, what should I do to contribute back to the community? Or can you give me a few tips? And this talk is my answer for those questions. And my goal here is to inspire who wants to contribute back to the community. And the most important fact I can say about myself is that I'm just like you. I'm a software engineer who writes code every day, discuss code reviews with teammates, avoid deployments on Fridays and stuff like that. And sometimes I contribute back to the community, but I don't consider myself open source guru or something. And I hope it's comforting to know that because I feel the imposter syndrome is real. And you may believe that contributing to the Elixir ecosystem is an impossible task or at least requires some, some kind of Jedi level. But if I do my job well with this presentation, you will realize that there's a pragmatic path you can follow. I work, in, I work at Intel Spark, where we are building a platform to connect, connect students, families, and professionals to help kids to have success on, on their education. And that platform is built entirely in Phoenix in, in Live View. And an interesting fact is that we have been using Live View since version 0.1.1. .1. I guess we, we like to live on the edge, but Actually, it has, it has been working very well. So reach out if you want to know more about our products or how we leverage Live View in our benefit. You know, my last name is Pereira, which is a confusing word to pronounce in English. And often people ask me how is to live in Portugal, but actually I'm from Brazil. You know, that part of the world where Elixir was born and also the place where there are no seasons except, of course, summer, because it's always summer there. And usually the temperature goes from hot to burning. <laughs> and now I'm living in Canada. Well, now I can feel the season, especially the winter, right? And like I said before, I'm a software engineer. And some time ago, I was reading this Erlang documentation, which, by the way, I recommend. And I found this. The word true was duplicated. At the time, I thought it was a good idea to fix it. I mean, that was not right, so why not fix it, right? All I had to do was to find the file and send a pull request. So what could go wrong, right? Well, not reading the contrib contribution guide and messing up with Git did not work well. It happens. And before we dive into the talks, it's very important to keep in mind that making mistakes is part of the process. Don't let them stop you. Don't feel that someone is judging you. I believe it's quite the opposite. You are trying to do something good or you are adding value to our community or at least trying to. So it should be good. Try to learn with them and move on. That's an important lesson. Keep that in mind. And people may have many different reasons to contribute to the Elixir ecosystem. You may, want to, you may want to learn more, promote yourself, give back to the community, fix something that is on your way, make new friends, endless reasons. And that's the why. And it's very personal, so I don't talk about it. 
This talk is about the how. How can I start? How can I give the first step? How to get help? What can I do? Those are prop popular common struggles. And also it's pretty common to believe that you need to create something new to be doing open source, but that's not really true. With that in mind, let me present some practical steps to overcome those struggles and a different approach to get you started. Okay, so how can I give you the first step? When you are learning or playing with a new language, we have this concept of hello world to give you a try in five minutes. It's a quick and easy way to get something done. But what about open source? Turns out we can consider improving documentation as a first step. A great one, actually. Contributing to documentation is like the hello world for open source, but with even greater benefits. Good documentation in the leak circle system is considered as important as the code itself. And you may have felt how much effort and love was put on documentation when work and reading docs every day and how that's important. Those docs have clear instructions, examples, guides, and so on. But they are not perfect. Actually, it's pretty hard and time consuming to keep them updated, well read and, and improve them over time. That's a community job. And when I say documentation, I'm not talking about functions on, but any place where we developers seek help, like for example, guides, which, which are very useful for our daily jobs. Be it a guide to install something or a guide instructions for programming, or also notes that you save the trouble for another developer, or maybe fix an example that you'd cause a bug. And again, saving someone from getting into issues or document missing options that the function accepts or clarify the behavior of an existing option. And of course, documentation also includes metadata and specs. Well, I could spend a whole day showing how documentation is valuable, but I promise that's the last one. So in order to improve documentation, you don't need to write a book or something. A sing single word fix would be enough. The goal here is to improve the developer experience. So any letter you change towards that goal is valuable. Another benefit is that you don't need to spend days to contribute. Just find the file, add the file, and send a pull request. Basically, that's it. Now, you may be wondering if helping with documentation is so useful as helping with code. But Think about that time when you could not find what was wrong with your code and you lost hours trying to fix it. Now multiply it for many other developers that could get into the same situation. Also, think about the experience of working with a library that has no documentation and another one that has good documentation. So contributing to documentation has a huge impact to your ecosystem. And finally, remember that our commun community has published more than 11,000 packages at this time, which means you don't need to be limited to Elixir only. So look around and try to help that library you like or use every day because there's a lot of room for contributions. Now, you may be asking, okay, so what's the hello world for contrib contributing with code? And turns out the answer is tests. You know, reading tests is probably the best way to discover how a project or library works internally, but I want to show you something more practical, something that may give you an opportunity to contribute more easily. The Elixir and libraries, be it offshore or from the community, they usually have a good suite of tests, but sometimes important blocks, of, important blocks or lines of code may lack test coverage. It may be a new feature that doesn't have tests for all edge cases or something that has changed and also doesn't have coverage. And that is where you can help improving the quality of tests. So let me show you a couple of examples. And for those who never saw a screen like that, it's the output of running all tests and the lines in red indicate those source code lines which are not tested, okay? And this one was from the plug library. The test coverage was showing that basically passing a map to a plug was missing a test. And 
of course it was working because that's pretty common to do but adding a test you guard against unintentional future breaks or can help other developers when reading the tests and again another example from plug and basically the same scenario look how the get macro has coverage and others macro does have coverage and again of course that was working so it's not about fixing it it's about improving the test suite look for important lines that have no tests those are potential opportunities to send a pull request and the same device for documentation fits well for this approach don't be limited to the leaks repository only look around on the community so let's see how to do that in some steps firstly of course you have to choose a project you want to contribute to then install the x coveralls package and configure the coverage options then just run it and open the coverage report that's all you need to get the test coverage for that specific project you'll find libraries with almost 100 percent coverage or much less depending on the library so focus to find important important lines that are missing tests for example a library that exposes some public functions and is lacking a test for any of them completely or just a specific part of that function and another one another example is when a function has conditionals and not not all of them have test coverage or branches on the code for dealing with edge cases those are some examples of good candidates to send a contribution but that really depends on the library and you need to navigate through the code and the coverage report to find out but keep in mind the goal here is not about increasing test coverage to 100 percent instead it is to find blocks of code where adding a test will improve the project and the quality of the tests okay and i want to show in details how to fork a project and send a pull request because there are a lot of good and free materials showing how to do that so let's use our time to talk about more stuff you may get to the point where you are not sure if you should send a pull request or not or maybe you are not sure how to write the documentation or code and don't worry that's fine you don't know all the internal details you are still learning right and your first contribution may not be so straightforward or easy but you have two valuable resources that you can use first one is reading similar tests or code that can be used as a base to write new code or change existing lines and the second one is asking for help the best you can do is to ask for clarification on an issue like for example asking which files you should focus ask for guidance to fix that issue or ask anything you need really and if you already have some experience with that code base you can just send a draft pull request to, to ask for feedback and i could i could show you dozens of examples but I, I don't need to the core team and the library authors they usually put a lot of effort in pre programming and code review to help you with your contribution so it's totally fine to send incomplete draft pull requests or even code that may not be so correct the lesson is if you don't know just ask and last but not least both elixir and phoenix have mailing lists to discuss the development of features or changes that co could cause a large impact on the code base so that's the place if you want to propose something or if you want to help with some proposal and libraries usually don't have a mailing list so then opening a niche on github would be the best approach so what what's next those are i mean those are the really the first steps but keep doing them until you feel more comfortable with the project to discover more about its details and how it works internally you can also leverage tools like debuggers to learn more about the code but that's another subject which is out of the scope of this presentation okay but which repositories could i contribute to try try taking a look on the libraries you already use first because it's easier to spot bugs or documentation that you can improve when you use that library every day 
And on the repository, you may find issues labeled as good for, good for first contribution or level beginner, which as the name suggests, are the ones you can take to begin contributing to that project. But if you're still lost when you try to fix those issues, don't get frustrated because there's no magic pill. It's part of the process. Just keep practicing until you get to the next level. And another great way to help is to reproduce the issues. You can create a project, just reproduce the problem and comment on the issue to help the maintainers. Doing that, you improve your skills and knowledge about that, that repository. Another tip is to enable GitHub notifications for some other projects to keep track of new issues or pull requests and take some time to study them because they are essentially a free source of knowledge. You can learn a lot by reading what other people are doing and discussing. And finally, if you get stuck, you can always ask around on forums, Twitter, Slack, and remember to always read the contribution guide and other guidelines that may be present on the repository to avoid problems or having your pull request closed because of that. In case it's not clear, let's see a real world example. This issue didn't look too complex to fix. Maybe just check the app name and raise or display a warning. So I decided to take a look on this issue. And to be honest, I had no clue where I should start. I knew it was related to Umbrella's apps and it happened after calling a mix command, but that's all I had. And then I found this file that gave me some light. Like I said before, reading tests is a great way to find more about the design of the project. The next step was to fork the project, run the test to make sure that everything was green and play around with those tests. Mostly change them to see what happens, what breaks, and what files they impact. That's probably the hardest part. And like I said before, there is no magic pill here. But have you noticed how that's not much different from fixing a bug on your own project? The main difference, difference is that usually you have to figure out yourself. You have to read the code, the bug, and follow it change tests to discover what's going on, and so on. It's like an experiment, but it's just a leak your code. There is no secret besides understanding the design. I get it's not easy, but investing some time to go through the code, you have good outcomes. And then I decided to send a pull request, explaining what I found and what I did. And that was Jose Valin's response. You see that my, co my code was not great, but he gave me another piece of the puzzle so I could continue working on that PR. And after some debugging, some IO inspects, discussions and code reviews, I finally made it work and it was merged. See, if you cannot find someone that is able to explain the code and the design for you, you really have to dig in until you realize what files you should look, which functions are responsible for each logic, the workflow and so on. The more you get involved, the more you learn. And two golden tips I can give to you. Uh, the first one is to read the library guidelines locate, located in this link. And the second one is to keep the code simple. There's no need to write fancy code, just the minimum that works well, because that's how Elixir and other libraries are built, which means you have more, more success if you follow those patterns. Okay, maybe writing documentation or code is not what you like to do, but fortunately, there are other ways to contribute to the ecosystem. So now let's talk about writing articles. It's not rock science, but let me give you a few tips on how you can write and publish it. First step is to work on the structure of your article. So let's go piece by piece. Take some time to come up with a good title that is short and self-explanatory that alone might be the reason someone decides to read your article or not. And some platforms, you present a hidden image that, that you help to grab the reader's attention, which is very hard to get among so much information on people's feeds nowadays. Okay, the title and the hidden image are both good, but you still need to convince the reader to actually 
keep reading. And the intro is your change to do that. It can be also used to promote your article on Twitter and other platforms. And that's optional, but it's worth mentioning it. If your article has a conclusion for a hard problem or a technical solution, consider adding a too long didn't read section to make it easier for people to find to find what they are looking for. And finally, the main content. It's up to you to write it well and find inspiration to write, but it doesn't need to be about complex subjects. Maybe you had some hard time to accomplish a task on your project and could not find an article about it. Maybe you had an, art, an idea on how to approach a problem or want to explain how a library works. There are many possibilities that you can explore. And I promise those are the only bullet points in this presentation. So let's see each item. And uh, try to find a header that has some meaning to the actual content. It's like a way to, to link them. And about platforms, there are other there are others, and you may not like some of them, but not publishing to a platform mean reaching less readers. Okay. And post your article to aggregators in order to read more readers and have a chance to get your article featured on newsletters like the Dixer, Radar, and others. And finally, use Twitter as a promoting tool. No need to pay for ads. Just talk about your article and you publish it. And speaking of writing article, you don't even need to host a personal blog. Again, you can use existing platforms to jumpstart a new blog for yourself. And OK, don't like to write documentation or code. Also, don't like to write articles okay fair enough but you may like to speak and that's another great way to help the community there are a lot of conference podcasts and meetups where you could share share your thoughts which means there is no space to put all of them in this slide but you can keep track you can keep track of what's happening in those links and keep in mind that creating content is not an easy task and conference and podcasts are not different. Usually podcasts, just like conference, they accept suggestions or proposals. So if you have an idea to share, consider reaching out. They appreciate your help. And that's a final reminder that sooner or later, your contribution will be denied. Yeah, that's not cool, but happens. What you believe is right or better may not be aligned with the project maintainer ideas or what the project needs at that moment. So, but that's not the end of the line either. Your contribution can become a new library or you can write or speak about it, okay? Oh, and remember that pull request that I messed up? Well, uh, I sent another one and it was merged. You don't need to be part of the core team or create a popular library or do whatever you believe is needed to gain a pass to contribute to the ecosystem. And your first contribution may not be perfect. Actually, most things you do at first are not great. And here I am giving my first international talk to prove that's true. So what matters is to share knowledge and deliver value. You can make the difference even with small contributions and taking small steps, and you can do it now. Thank you very much.